How's it going people? If you're watching this video it's likely you have some interest in cars, whether that's supercars, classic cars or any other category that suits your fancy. However, there is a certain section of the car world that we as car guys and girls don't really admit we enjoy, and with good reason. The cars on this list have been dubbed hairdressers cars, which basically means they're the types of cars that aren't about resale value, acceleration, top speed, fuel economy, braking, practicality, reliability, engineering, use of materials, or anything that we as car people love. Ultimately, all these cars are for is substanceless style, and sometimes all we really care about is style. That's not to say that some of these cars don't have substance, it would be unfair of me to say they're all awful. I'll give them a fair critique throughout this video, as well as a brief history and some interesting facts, and you can let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with my opinions on them. Even if we love to hate them, or hate to love them, some of these cars are at least the foundations of cars that we can mostly agree have quite a lot of substance. But at the same time, some of these cars I probably wouldn't be seen dead in, out of fear of being laughed out of the car community. Some key features of hairdressers cars, they look fun and bubbly, as in they they have unnecessary bulges rather than muscles. Keep that in mind as we go through the list. Remember to like the video if you enjoy it, comment if you agree or disagree with my picks, and subscribe for more weekly car content. So without further ado, let's get into the list. This week's special mention is the Mini Hatchback. This throwback to the original Mini is one of my least favourite cars just out of principle. Why is it called a Mini? The original was a tiny car, one of the smallest you could buy on the market at the time. In comparison, the new Mini sits alongside other hatchbacks like the Polo or Fiesta in terms of size. There's a whole class of car below it in size, like the VW Up or the Skoda Citygo. I could probably accept it as a Mini if it was at least the same size as those cars. The new Mini certainly fits the bill when it comes to hairdressers cars, and the convertible in particular fits this class of car perfectly. However, if you've ever been in a new Mini, you'll know it's actually quite a nice car. Of course, it's a little bit style over substance, but the interior is comfortable in the normal versions of the car at least, and surprisingly sporty in the S versions. On top of this, the John Works Cooper is a properly solid car, even in terms of substance, as it puts out a turbocharged 228 horsepower and does 0 to 60 in just 5.9 seconds. That doesn't sound particularly hairdresser-ish to me. I won't go into much more detail on the car as it's just a special mention, but we'll try and get a review done on a John Works Cooper in the near future. Subscribe so you know when that hits. Ultimately, the Mini would be a little more acceptable and less hairdresser-ish if they just put a BMW badge on it. Coming in at number 5 this week is the Mercedes-Benz SLK, now known as the SLC. This car has a special place in my heart as one of the PE teachers at my high school used to drive one, and since I went to a boys school, he did get a bit of stick for it being a hairdresser's car. Especially ironic considering he had no hair. The SLK actually stands for something, as Mercedes wanted to design a car that was sporty, light and short, which in German translates to sportlich, leicht und kurz, hence we have an SLK. When the name was changed to SLC in 2016, it was simply to align the car with the C-Class, suggesting this is the rotor equivalent of cars like the C63 AMG etc. In terms of the history of the car, it's had three main generations. The R170 was the original SLK, which was in production from 1996 to 2004, and features a minimum minimalist exterior design. These are super cheap second hand now and you can pick one up for less than a grand, which is quite tempting I'm not going to lie because it's a Mercedes and I'm young, but I know as soon as I get one I'm going to get rinsed by my friends and other car people. After this came the R171, which ran from 2004 to 2010, with a facelift in 2008 that offered new engines and some minor exterior modifications to the front bumper and wing mirrors. At this point I'd say they start to look a little bit less hairdressery, but they definitely still have that image attached based on how short they are. The third generation is the R171 which started production in 2011 and is still being produced today, though as I said previously it was renamed in 2016 and was facelifted to match the front ends of the C-Class. The SLC is a particularly mean looking car at the front, but as you get further back it's like the designer started taking a course in hairdressing at around maybe the windscreen and fully completed it by the rear bumper, because the car just falls away into bubbliness, so much potential to be so much more muscly. Each of the cars has at least one AMG version, the best of which is probably the R172 or third generation pre -face lift SLK 55 AMG, which is a 5.5 litre V8, putting out 415 horsepower and going from 0 to 60 in 4 seconds. That's pretty ridiculous for a car in the hairdresser family. This version of the SLK also kind of looks like a baby brother of the incredible SLR. Slap some vertical gullwing doors on that SLK and you can at least pretend to yourself that you're driving
driving an SLR. I think what puts this car in the hairdresser category is simply its size. To me it looks like they originally designed the car to be 1.25 times larger, but ran out of materials, so just made them a tad smaller during production. Overall, this car definitely fits the hairdresser stereotype, at least in terms of the non-AMG versions, and the older you go, the more hairdressery the car is. No offence, Salamondrin. At number 4 this week we have a car I mentioned in a previous video, the Porsche Boxster. This car certainly has substance, it's a Porsche so it's made to be luxury but also have some strong equipment on it. However, while the original Boxster was marketed at car people, it seemed to become a bit of a flaky fashion statement instead. As I mentioned before it features in Legally Blonde, which just tells you exactly how hairdressery this car really is. There have been 4 generations of the Boxster and, like the SLK in my opinion, they become less hairdressery over time. The first generation 986 came at a time of hardship for Porsche, where they were struggling struggling financially and needed a car to help boost sales, as 911s weren't selling as well as they used to. The 986 Boxster was critically acclaimed when they shared the concept model in 1993, and sales went through the roof when the final version was made. It is for this reason that the 986 is generally heralded as the car that saved Porsche. Every version of the car is mid-engined rather than being rear-engined like the 911, which means that it has a low centre of gravity and near-perfect weight distribution. This makes the 986 handle really well. But for me, the concept is a far cooler car than the 986. Which which seems to swap the muscle for bubble. The 986 was followed by the 987 between 2005 and 2012 with one facelift in 2009 which switched up two of the engines to produce more horsepower as well as making the car a little sportier. Then the 981 appeared in 2012 and at this point I feel like we're starting to shed the hairdresser look pretty well. Not sure why they went back in numbers though. I would probably have a 987 facelift but I would definitely have a 981. It's such a good looking car and there's one I often drive past on my way to uni which has a great spec. The only thing still throwing back to that hairdresser look is a soft top convertible roof. After the 981 in 2016, the 718 appeared, and while this looks great and is definitely out of the hair salon now, they kind of ruined it a bit for me by switching from a flat 6 engine to a turbocharged 4 cylinder one. They did this as a nod to the historical Porsche that won the Targa Florio race in 1959 and 1960, as it was an example of a less powerful car that was light and manoeuvrable and beat all of the overly powerful cars. However, most people that drive a Porsche Boxster are probably more interested in how the car sounds than whether or not it's a nod to Porsche's racing heritage. This is displayed by the fact that the 718 received almost universal criticism for the sound of the engine, and Top Gear even suggested it has cheapened the Porsche experience. But, in terms of the car being a hairdresser's car, this is probably a step in the right direction again from Porsche, as the 718 is the best performing boxer to date, so they're clearly doing away with more style features and focusing on the substance. They've just got to remember that 99% of the time a consumer is driving, they won't be on a racetrack. Again, the Boxster clearly has hairdresser connotations attached to it, particularly the older models, however the car is pretty solid in its own right, as you would expect from any Porsche, despite some of the engines being a little unreliable. Would I say no if someone offered me one? Probably not. Would I get rinsed by my friends? Almost definitely. But do they have Porsches? No. Onto the top 3 now, and in 3rd this week we have the BMW Z3 Roadster. This car has a particularly special place in my heart as it's a car I very nearly bought last year, after I missed out on a bidding war by £12. So sad. But anyway, the Z3 clearly has those bubbly features we were talking about earlier in the video. There was only one generation of the car which was produced between 1995 and 2002, however it did receive a subtle facelift in 1999 which actually had a massive effect on making the car less hairdressery, in my very biased opinion. The facelift redesigned the headlights and and noticeably, the taillights became L-shaped. Most importantly, the car was widened by 2.5 inches, making it look more bulky overall on the wheel arches, and the rims were replaced to have slightly more presence on the car than the previous uninteresting ones. It's a shame they didn't start the Z3 looking like the facelift, as the pre-facelift Z3 featured in the James Bond film Goldeneye, and the James Bond limited edition Z3 was on sale from 1996. But good luck getting your hands on one of those, as only 100 were made. Don't worry about it too much anyway, it's a hairdresser's car. Remember? The Z3 shares its platform and engine with the BMW E36, ranging from a 4 cylinder 1.8 at 114 brake horsepower to a 6 cylinder 3 litre that produces 228 horsepower. However, as with most BMWs, the Z3 has a saving grace from the clutches of hairdresserdom in that it has M Sport versions, the Z3 M Roadster and Coupe. The Coupe in particular is a world renowned classic which tends to split opinion a bit because of its shoe like design, however it's definitely not a hairdresser's car. Furthermore, as the Z3 M's are appreciated 
deteriorating in value, it's likely the standard Z3s will also become more valuable, which we have certainly seen in the last year. I was watching the car closely as I was planning on buying one, and they seemed to get further and further out of reach as the year went by. Obviously, this little roadster fits perfectly into the hairdresser category. It's small, it's convertible, it's bubbly, but it's also becoming a classic, as I believe most BMW roadsters will. Just look at the prices for the Z1, and then reconsider your opinions on the Z3 as a long-term investment. I'm obviously biased towards this car, it just pains me because I know in my heart it's a hairdresser mobile. At number 2 this week we have the Mazda MX-5 or, for Americans, the Miata. This car is a classic and is loved by many, there is no doubt about that. However, it still has that hairdresser image attached to it, because of its size and the fact that it looks like a little fun car. A Mark 1 MX-5 even appears at the end of the only Black Mirror episode that has a happy ending, showing you the type of connotations attached to this car. So far, there have been 4 generations of the MX-5, the NA, the NB, the NC and the ND. And on this occasion, the N doesn't actually stand for anything while the secondary letter is just denoting the generation of MX-5. The 1989-1997 NA is the original MX-5 with a pretty iconic look and feel to the car. Yes, it's small, and yes, it's a roadster, but it's also renowned for being a great handling car because of its 50-50 weight balance and has received countless awards over the years, so it has a bit of substance. It also has history to it. The NA was made at a time when there really weren't many other roadsters on the market, so it pretty much spearheaded the return of the roadsters. The designers took inspiration from the British roadsters that had been around a decade previously, and wanted to make something like those for the Japanese market. Little did they know it was going to be a huge success and sell over 400,000 worldwide. You can easily recognise the NA by its pop-up headlights, which are a staple feature of the car, and I think even though they're a little bit fun, they're actually pretty swaggy. Even though it's a hairdresser's car by name, it's loved by most people in the car world, probably because it's so easy to drift, modify or race. Strange how we hold these double standards on hairdresser cars. The 1998-2005 to NB is another car which is well loved and pretty stacked in terms of potential modifications. Even even if it is a little bit more bubbly than the NA, even the facelift version has a few curves. The NC for me is the most hairdresser-esque MX-5 of the lot. It's got bubbles, it's got curves, and overall the car just isn't very interesting when compared to its former glory, but again that's just my opinion. The 2016 ND however, I would say, is a pretty dench car. It comes in two versions, Roadster and Retractable Fastback. Both of them are much more angular than we have seen from the MX-5s in the past, and despite being shorter, I would say they are much less hairdressery. The RF in particular particular is such a good looking car. I severely hope these depreciate massively in value like the NCs because I'm more than happy to get labelled as a hairdresser if I get to own and drive one of these bad boys. So while the car is loved by many car people worldwide, it can't really escape the hairdresser title simply because of it being a roadster that's made to have fun in. That said, it doesn't stop a lot of people from buying them and interest for the car on the second hand market is higher than ever, particularly with the NAs. Finally, I'm sure you've guessed what car is at number one on this list, the famous Audi TT. I hear you at home saying, but JB, you love Audis, how can you manage when this one's so hairdressery? I love the Audi TT. Simple. Sorry if you feel differently. Not every Audi TT though. Just the Quattros that are as or more powerful than the 225 1.8 Turbo. When I think of a hairdresser's car, this is the car that comes to mind first. Look at the Mark 1 in particular, it is literally just a bubble on top of a bubble. But, and I'm ignoring anything that isn't a Quattro when I say this, their four-wheel drive, handle well, will drive on pretty much any surface, open to any modifications, and are ultimately, to me, the best hairdresser cars on the market. The TT takes its name from the Isle of Man TT, as two companies that won the event in the 1900s called NSU and DKW merged together to form Audi. And there are three generations of the car. The Mark 1 was produced between 1998 and 2006 and is renowned for that bubble shape. The best model from the range in my opinion is a 3.2 litre V6, though the 1.8T Quattro Sport is the most rare, with only 800 being sold in the UK. The Mark II followed from 2006 to 2014 and featured a much bulkier body. At this point, the S-Line variants appeared, with a wider and meaner body kit to match the TTS and TTRS, which are great cars in their own right, but are often disregarded as jumped-up hairdressers' cars, probably because that's basically what they are. This is the same with the Mark III TT, which is the least most hairdressery in my opinion, given how angular it is. Though in this case, the TT suffers from being regarded as the poor man's R8, especially as the two cars share some clear similarities visually. However, if you look at the Mark III TT as its own car, it is actually pretty incredible, particularly the RS, which puts out almost 400 brake horsepower from a 2.5 litre engine. If you somehow get all of the Audi Sport performance parts on the RS, it becomes an absolute monster. It would take some imagining to turn this car into a hairdresser's car. 
Overall then, though this is the most hairdressery car on this list, it's also the one I want the most. I'm not ashamed to say that. It's a powerful, four-wheel drive Audi. Think of it like that, and suddenly it becomes a lot cooler than the original Mark 1 bubble car appeared to be. So, to recap, I've given you my take on the top 5 hairdressers cars that we hate to love, or love to hate. Those were the Mercedes SLK, the Porsche Boxster, the BMW Z3, the Mazda MX-5, and the glorious Audi TT, as well as the Mini Hatchback as a special mention. If you agree or disagree with any of my picks, make sure to comment down below and let me know your reasons why, or just rinse me for liking pretty much all of these cars. Remember to like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to my channel for more content like this, as well as other car related videos. If you haven't seen my previous video on the top 5 cheap supercars, click the link in the outro screen to check that out. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, I'll see you in the next one.